all around us are people who need someone to be there for them. Someone to support them, to walk through life with them, and help them see their potential in Christ. Tonight we have the honor of talking with Dr. Dennis Burke as he shares his life and the story of redemption that he experienced, all because someone in the church was willing to engage and to step into his life to be Christ to him. We hope you're encouraged by this testimony of transformation that took a young man who was lost, became a world changer, who now shares the powerful message of grace to people all over the world. Tonight we are talking to a group of very mature men and women in Christ. Everybody here, I think, has been a Christian pretty much the last 30, 40, 50, and plus years. Am I right? Yes. Dennis is included. Um, And so oftentimes we come in into these settings in church and we have um, someone preach a message to us and it's good and it's what we needed to hear. Um, But there's also this intimacy that of really knowing what's going on in each other's lives and knowing what's going on in Dennis's life and his journey that he took to get to this point that sometimes we don't get to hear. Um, have you any, has anyone ever wondered what's it like to be a traveling minister? Um, maybe even some of you desired to be that or do desire to be that. Um, what kind of faith journeys has he had to work through And what kind of wisdom could we pull on from his soul and his spirit that we could step into sync in our own lives? And so it's my heart to not just do something because this is what we've always done, but it's my heart to do what's right for the season that we're in. And and right now we're talking a lot about walking together in life, doing more than a Sunday morning, but actually coming alongside of each other practically um, and, and listening from someone who has done that for years and years and years. So I think that tonight, as we walk through some, an interview-style evening, um, I want you to be thinking about gleaning from what he has to say, but also, what are your questions? Um, what kinds of things would you ask, Dennis, or that maybe you're wor- working through right now that you just need a little bit more wisdom on? Um, and what we'd like to do is, is be able to incorporate some of those questions as we go along, so... Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Well, I'm glad because that's what we're going to do. <laughs> so, um, so Dennis, I would love for you to just, we started off talking a little bit about like, what's his background? You know, where did he come from? What was your home like? Were you always a Christian? Did you come out of the womb saved? What does this look like for you? <laughs> I grew up in California, Southern California, and I escaped to Texas, uh, in 1976, but I was, uh, yeah, just full disclosure, born in 1954, and uh, the family I grew up in, I always thought it was a normal family. You know, normal is a strange concept, actually, and you, you come to realize that really normal, kind of like average, doesn't really exist. The Average home in America apparently has 2.3 children, but there's not one home in America that has 2.3 children, (laughs) and so that doesn't exist. So normal, you know, you kind of feel like it's normal, but uh, we were just uh, living in Southern California, not far from Los Angeles. Dad had a good job. We had a reasonably good family, at least I thought. I mean, it's the only one I knew. And uh, so you come to find out later that a lot of things that went on in the dynamics you grew up in, while they looked normal or looked okay or looked typical, that it really was really far from normal. And uh, so my household, my family growing up, I mean, we went to church some. It wasn't a major part of our life. Christianity, we would consider ourselves Christian, though we maybe none of us were born again, actually. You know, definitions are weird. I mean, the, the concepts that we live with and grow up with are strange. But as a young guy, we would go to church periodically, but church was not really a part, or let me say it this way, prayer and the Bible and things that I've come to realize, that wasn't really a part of our weekly life at all. The only praying I remember happening in our family as a young guy, real young guy, 
was the prayer my sister or I would pray over our food. Let's have, let's, Dennis, let's have you pray over the food. So this is it. We get the two people that know the least about anything. And let's have them do the most important thing that should happen in a house. And anyway, that's retrospect. But um, So we did go to church some, you know. And uh, we didn't have a spiritual life, really. And it wasn't really a... Looking back, plenty of gaps and problems in the way things went. We did do one thing, I recall, and there was more than one. It, it was, we had a good middle class life, so no, no complaints on that score. I never was without, except affection. And certain things that really you find later are a lot more important. But uh, we did go, and we were talking about this today. We went to a Billy Graham meeting. It was, looking back now, knowing the history, it was the largest meeting he'd ever had. It was in Los Angeles in 1963. I was nine years old. And I went forward one of the two nights that we went. It was days-long meetings, but we went twice, at least twice. I was nine. I just got up and went from the upper levels all the way down onto the grass and knelt there with a counselor and prayed a prayer and gave my life to Jesus. The next night, my, my dad and my older sister, they both went forward. I think my mother thought she was saved, and maybe she was. She had grown up Methodist, and God loves Methodists. So she may have been saved, but she didn't go forward there. And while that had a dramatic impact on my life, it did. There were things about this new relationship and reality of God that just didn't stick as well as it really should have or could have. And you look back and you say, you know, if I'd had some guidance, if I'd had some input, different kinds of encouragement, you know, you look at all the things that maybe could have made it different, but uh, that wasn't there, so that's not the way it turned out. And so our, my early life in those days in California, while there was, there wasn't suffering in a lot of ways, but there were a lot of gaps and a lot of issues. The late 60s, mid 60s to late 60s, you know, was a confusing time in the world, really. And certainly it was in Southern California where I was. And with a lot of the, the changes that were going on, you know, when I was coming of age, 11, 12, 13 years old, these issues were circulating and surrounding not just me, but everybody. But the whole drug scene and the whole rock and roll scene of Southern California, where I was anyway, it, it just started to draw me in. And I found myself really wrapped up in this whole, this whole drug and rock and roll culture and rebellion and all that went along with that. So it was, it turned into a lot of dark times in that way. You'd look back and think you're on the cutting edge and being your, your own person and doing your own thing and nobody's going to tell me what to do and I'll have my hair as long as I want it and all of these things. You're just a young guy. I think back, I'm thinking, good Lord, how did you get that screwed up in so few years? The same as the rest of us, exactly, see? And so for me, it was, uh, it was a number of years, even though I knew that this experience I had had at a Billy Graham crusade was as important and powerful as it was. And I continued to get the little magazine they would send out, Decision Magazine. I got it every month. God bless Billy Graham. I know where he is, of course, but, you know... Faithfully, this thing came and it would say decision on the big, you know, it looked like that big. And so I had to see it every time it showed up. And it reminded me. I didn't think about it a lot. I did my best not to. But part of the reason for this kind of trek was, you know, you look back and you say, with the, uh, the lack of guidance and the lack of things that could have made a difference for me, you know, I chose these, made these bad decisions to go a real different way based on, you know, um, certainly the surroundings, the environment, the cultural pull, the 
rebellion. Not everybody was in rebellion. Not everybody was messed up. Not everybody was into the kinds of things I was, but that's where I gravitated. And uh, so there was a point in this story for me that took a real dark turn, and it was already fairly dark, but while we just had a typical suburban type family and household and, you know, things looked like everything should be okay and dog in the backyard and two cars and, you know, all of that. You know, there was just things going on that I didn't realize how deep it was even for my own parents. And so at 13 years old, I'm startled by my mother one morning to wake up and find that my father has committed suicide. Well, that just pushes a 13-year-old guy further down the rabbit hole as far as it went for me. You know, you just go to relieve whatever you want to call it, the pain of things. And the only way that you figured out does that which really doesn't do that. At 13, you're an idiot. Do you just... Are there any 13... I'm sorry if there's a 13-year-old here. I mean, you know how it is. There's something that happens at adolescence. I'll try to be mild on this, but considering the crowd, you'll understand this. Adolescence, in that stage, there is what, what I consider to be the impartation of total knowledge. The 13-year-old knows everything. I don't need to be told. I am, I am 13 now. I know. You don't have to tell me. And there's this pushback from everything. And of course, you don't know anything. Well, you feel like you do. You get this. So for me anyway, that just turned into even more of a reason to space out and disconnect. And for me, it became really the music because in the late, you know, some of this, the late 60s, early 70s, the music really took a major turn and it became, it really became the music not regarding an emotion or a love, you the love of my life, I love you with all my heart, you and me forever. It became ballads and it became Voices of what was taking place at the time politically and, and uh, injustices and dealing with things that were pretty heavy stuff that nobody seemed, at least in my remembrance, they didn't have real answers for, but they had a lot of questions. And so it all became about the questions. And you find you never get the right answers by asking the wrong questions. If we're not asking the kind of questions that lead us to the right conclusions, then we end up with a path to confusion, to lawlessness, to rebellion, and to different things. And that's really an assessment of a lot of what was going on, at least from my point of view. So I ended up in a deep and dark rabbit hole for a lot of years. And I was having a conversation where we were, four of us had gotten together. This was just a few years ago. With, a cup, with another minister, the, we were a cup, two couples. We'd gone to just have a few days together and R&R and stuff, but we decided we would just sit and talk about these kind of things. How, how did you get saved? What happened for you? And we just kind of went around the four of us. And so I started talking about my normal childhood. And then I mentioned the suicide of my father at 13. And then the drug life, and then the this, and then the that, and these friends. And, and they, the, the guy, he had been a stoner, so he got it and understood. But he said, uh, somebody said to me along about then, I said, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, let's back up. Earlier you said you had a normal childhood. You know, I don't remember, I don't think you've said anything here that sounds extremely normal. But isn't that how we all kind of look at it? Our own experiences were, well, for us, it was, that was the norm. Each day was the same. 
in the sense that it was no more answers than we had yesterday, no more depth, no more direction. It was a drift. I don't know. So when I look back at those earliest days, you know, I don't look back at it with a lot of, a lot of heartache over everything, but you see the gaps and you see now back to what really would have made a difference. What could have changed for me? And if it would have changed something for me, I, I'm sure it would have changed something for my friends if they had had the things that now you come to realize would have made a difference then. And um, anyway, so my early, earliest days were, ended up tough days for a number of years. And thankfully, not a lot of years. But, uh, you know, till I was 17. So it was those six years or so that I really, uh, you know, found myself getting in a darker and darker and deeper, deeper hole. I don't know. Was that the answer to your question? You don't even need me. You just so good. You got this. <laughs> but I need you. <laughs> so if I can just ask you some questions about like that place of darkness. Um, obviously, we all had our own seasons of darkness and all our own things that we felt have been dark. But, but I don't know if anyone here has had a suicide in their life of that magnitude where it's your own dad and your own father what kind of dynamics happened in the home between 13 and 17? Was your mom available? Was she able to walk you through this? Were you very lost? Did you have other men who came into your life to walk with you? What did that look like? Yeah. Um, that, that helped contribute to the whole, the whole mess I found myself in. You know, mom married 20 years. My older sister you know, was still living at home, but she was about to get married, and that was, she was leaving shortly. Uh, My mom was sort of numb also. She didn't have answers. She didn't know the depth of what all had happened and why. Mm -hmm. She knew there was trouble. She knew there was a lead up to this, but you know, you don't, too often, so often, you don't see how deep this is until you start to think about it after the fact. And so she was sort of numb and in shock herself. But she also had the now responsibilities of figuring out the finances, figuring out how we're going to continue. And all of this was now solely on her. I wasn't helping. I was part of the problem, you know, it seemed like. And yet, and we had a decent relationship, but she was, she could be tough. Oh, you know, I love my mom. She's in heaven. She knows it's all true. She was, she was, you know, loving in so many ways and really tough in so many ways. But she, so to answer your question, no, she really didn't give me a great deal of input as to how to navigate through these waters. There wasn't really talk in depth of what that does to your emotions. How has this left you, Dennis? Uh, What's going on for you? I mean, she's figuring out what's going on for her. And she didn't have a support, really. Mm -hmm. Our church really didn't. I mean, it it ended up, the church we went to, and like I said, it wasn't that we were overly involved at that stage at all. We were just attend periodically. You know, this was the kind of church had a lot of cigarette butts out at the front door because that was the last thing most people were doing before they came in, put the cigarette out. And and then my dad would have been one of those. And so my dad had actually, regressing a little bit, but this is why I'm answering the way I am. My dad had actually called the minister to come over and talk to him for just just a few days before he took his life. And they would have spent, you know, a couple of hours. But then you realize that didn't really do anything. Now, you can't blame the minister. Somebody has to listen and take it and receive it and run with it for it to have an impact. But you can't help as a kid or as a maybe a disappointed in shock wife wonder 
why the heck didn't the minister have any impact on this? What happened? And those are the kind of questions that you play with. So you don't play long, you just kind of go on. I didn't have any input from my mom on this. The minister that I, I don't recall ever speaking to me in any way, shape, or I don't remember anybody from the church reaching out to me at all over this. And the doctor that lived across the street from us at that point, and he had come over to help when my dad died. A year or so later, he sort of reached out to me. But that didn't end up being a good thing. Because he had his own set of demons. And that went south. I didn't know it until after I was saved and gave my heart to the Lord and got out of all kinds of stuff and away from the drugs. But that ended up being a real destructive sort of thing also. You know, when you're already over into... Yeah, this sounds a little dramatic maybe, but the devil's playground. And you're already dancing that dance, uh, there's just a lot of that amplifying and getting even bigger. So, no, you know, uh, I don't recall having somebody. Had I had a church, it could have made a difference, I think. Had I had, you know, you look back, what would have changed that? Well, hey, you know, you got to be listening and you got to be ready to take it and willing for it to make a difference anyway. But no, to answer your question, no, I really didn't have any input. That was a long answer for that short question. You're but a preacher. Thank you. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> I know. It's, sorry about that. No, it's good. I think that oftentimes, us as a church, and speaking to the generation that's mostly represented here tonight, we've often talked, and David talked about this even on, on Mother's Day, how oftentimes we, th- we can feel, and even I can feel, um, that how do we really be... Um, How do we really reach into the generation underneath us, you know? The children, I know John and Eva, you guys have worked with kids for years and years and years and have always preached the message of, you know, you need to continue to see the kids. The kids cannot be invisible to us as a church and that we need to remember that they are valuable and that they're not just kids to go down in the basement and for us to forget about. Um, and as you're saying that, you know, that you had someone reach out to you, but that they weren't of the right spirit. And I think it's really important for us as a church to realize that the devil's after our kids. Right. And if we don't fill the role of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and just someone to encourage them, that someone else might step into their life that also has a message. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember a, a man in our church named Jake, and um, I was maybe five or six years old in the Mennonite church, and every week I would find him, and he would ask me if I could whistle. And I couldn't whistle. I still can't whistle. But every week he would say, if you try, I'll give you a cert. And I loved certs. You know, and it was enough to make me get up in the morning on Sunday and go, I got to find Jake. It wasn't even really for Jesus, but it was for a cert. But it was that there was someone who loved me and who remembered me and who thought about me and who carried certs just for me something so simple and I think as we speak into this generation and I think that we have to remember that we still have great value in the presence of these little kids like you know Soraya and Knox and you know some of these little guys that are just being born that they look for you they look for us Absolutely. you know and that's the hand extended down and not to think that we don't have a place but that we have a place and we need to remember that Absolutely. You know, and that just reminded me of, of that as you were speaking. Well, how many little moments like that, if, and when we look back, I mean, that's a perfect example that you gave. But how many times in our own histories, you think back of your own life, was it just, a, uh, just somebody's comment or a word to you, good or bad, mm-hmm. that sticks with you to this day? You remember the moment or you remember the emotion that came or you remember the, you know, the uh, embarrassment that it turned into or you remember the attention that you liked. They wouldn't remember this at all. It wasn't probably an emotional moment for them in any way. But when we touch a person's emotions, this sticks with them. And so when a young person, any one of us, we've got the capacity to actually make a deposit into someone in a very easy, very easy way. 
in this case, assert. That's real easy. easy. Man, you're a pretty easy one. Now, that's for sure, you know. But uh, just a word or a comment. Boy, you have got the most beautiful smile. If somebody's never heard that before, and they've struggled with their appearance or whatever goes on, suddenly, that was a moment that ch touched their entire life. Mm -hmm. And for the person that said it, it was just a good observation and a good moment. They probably wouldn't remember it at all. So we have that kind of capacity anyway, but uh, for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. and, and when coupled with the Holy Spirit's prompting, mm -hmm. how much more impactful is that? Um, so, Dennis, when you got to 17, you turned your life around. Is that That's 17? right. So yeah. what did that look like for you? Because, I mean, this was a pretty deep, like you said, a deep place, and now a yeah. radical change in a different direction. What did that look like? You know, it's crazy how this came. Crazy in that it had to be a God thing, you know. So I'll, ta I'll take you through a little of that story, but, I mean, that's what we're doing here, so. I... Uh, I, this sounds pathetic, and I know it does, but I had one standard in my drug life, and that was I was not going to use heroin. I would smoke anything that burned. I would pretty well drop any acid, whatever the name was, and wherever it came from, somebody's sink. I mean, that's, it's just scary thinking about all this. But, uh, but heroin was something I'd never do. And... Uh, I didn't realize until years later why I had that. And it was something my dad had told me at 12 years old. Whoops. And at uh, 12 years old, he sat down, you know, on the edge of my bed one time. He said, look, Dennis, he said, uh, I don't want you to ever start, don't ever start smoking marijuana. Now, I, I already was, even then. And so I don't know if, he actually knew that I did or not, or suspected it or whatever. Uh, or he just, he just had this conversation with me. He didn't say. But he told me this. He said, if you start smoking marijuana, he said, it'll lead to, it'll lead to heavier drugs. And he said, you'll go to a party one day, and some of your friends, they'll bring heroin, and you'll take it, and you'll end up an addict, and it'll wreck your life. So just don't start. So I listened, but, you know, as a 12-year-old, that impartation of total knowledge had already set in on me, and so you kind of did, that's the corniest, that isn't going to happen, you know, blah, blah, blah. you know, and you just blow it off. At least I did. And I realized not every 12-year-old was is as stupid as I was, but, you know, that's where I was at. And the reason I said that is because at 17 years old, I went to the party my dad described. He'd been gone for several years now. But I ended up going to this party. And lo and behold, just like my dad had nearly prophesied, it was kind of a big party and they were supposed to go bring something else and they ended up bringing heroin and I did. I took it that night. First time ever. I crossed the line. I knew I had. Now, it's not much of a line, I granted. I, so. But here's what happened. In the morning after this party, when I woke up, I had two thoughts almost simultaneously, one right after the other like that. When I opened my eyes, the first thought I had was I want to do that again right now. That's how strong that hit me. So I understand how these guys get addicted to, to these real hard, crazy stuff really quick. Because, I mean, it hit me. And, you know, looking back, you can almost imagine the devil just waiting for my eyes to open. You got to hear this, Dennis. You need this again right now. You know, and whether that was the case or not, man, that was the first thought that hit me. But almost simultaneously, here came the voice of my dad. And it, it scared me. I could almost hear ex that exact conversation. This is going to wreck your life. And it was laying there that morning that I came to a conclusion. I'm not going this way. I'm going to pursue Jesus. The Jesus movement was on. 
It was already this major thrust of young people getting saved, long hair stoners, turning their lives over to Jesus. It was getting some press by this time. This was 1971. It had been going on a couple of years now. Actually, technically, you look back, it started in 67. Very few people knew it then, but that's when it actually began. But by 71, it was, it was happening. There was a lot of this going on, this Jesus talk. And now nobody really much talked to me about Jesus except one guy, a guy named John Ryan. John Ryan had been more of a space cadet than I was. He had gone to the outer reaches of the universe and he had not quite made it back yet. But he had given his life to Jesus and he was going to a church down in Redondo Beach called Bethel Tabernacle. I had never heard of these things then. But going back and doing some research since, I found that Bethel Tabernacle was, by some people's estimation, the birthplace of the Jesus movement. There was three places where this started almost simultaneously, in Seattle, in San Francisco, and then here in Redondo Beach, California. In 1967, something began to happen where young people began to give their lives to the Lord. And they were reaching out to this this element, these long hair, hippie, lost, goofed up stoners, dropped out, drugged out. But it began to happen. Well, by 71, you know, this Bethel Tabernacle that I'd never been to and really never heard of, uh, John Ryan started to talk to me about this, and he started to talk about some of the wildest stuff I'd ever heard of. I mean, I'd been to church. You know, you think you know what it's all about. I'd never heard of anything like this. And he started talking to even, and he carried a great big Bible, man. We're going to, we're going to school. He carried a big Bible. And uh, plopped that down on his desk and, you know, just made a scene. But he started talking about what was happening. He was the only guy that really talked to me at all about Jesus. And he was really tough to understand because... You know, while he knew he was saved and going to heaven, no doubt about that. Looking back at some of the things he said to me, I realized he had no clue what was really happening in his own life, you know. (laughs) But uh, I was so disconnected to so many things that anything John said was, for me, it was just, wow, that is so far out. I got to find out about this. And he started talking to me about speaking in tongues. Now, let me, let me just address this for a moment. I'm, this is a long answer. It's good. You're good. All right. So just jump in any time, you know. <laughs> this guy's like, hey, I get a microphone, you know. Um, but John started talking to me about this. I'd never even heard of this. Speaking, what is that? speaking in tongues. And for me, if it was far out, I want to know what we're talking about here, you know, because everything needed to be far out. You know? <laughs> and I'll never forget, John, he described this to me. He said, Dennis, it's amazing. He said, at the end of, of church, I'll stand up. And, you know, he's telling me this, so he does this. Mm-hmm. I stand up. And I walked to the front of the church. And an angel comes and touches my tongue. And I begin to speak in the language of angels. I'm saying, I have got to see this. (laughs) Well, come to find out. At the church, Bethel Tabernacle, the culture there was they would have song service and play tambourines and shout. There was more hair in this place than you've ever imagined. And uh, just a bunch of stoners by this time. Now, the church didn't start that way, but it was that way now. And it was packed out. It was packed out every night of the week, Monday through, Monday through Friday. I think they had a Saturday and then two services Sunday. I mean, it, it was going on. And it was jammed out every service. But the culture was after a service, everybody that was part of that church was told, now if this is your church and you're a part of the church, here's what we do. You come down here to the front 
and uh, find a spot down here, and we're going to pray in tongues for an hour. And they did this every single day, every service. So when John's talking about standing up and walking, it wasn't, he wasn't alone in this. And, you know, now we know, of course, it wasn't an angel coming down to touch his tongue. and he began, So he had no clue. Right. But for me, it was perfect because it was like, it was like drawing me in. And so, uh, anyway, I got lost in my own story here, but when I, backing back up to this moment when I, when things had to shift for me, I made a decision then. I'm going to pursue Jesus. And I wasn't comfortable going back to the church that I had gone to some, you know, I just didn't think that was, you know, what I was after. So I just started looking for a church. You know, finding a church is not easy. Particularly when you don't know one from the other. They all, they're all the same. They got just, it's a church. You know, you don't know labels. You don't know anything. So I just went to one close. You know, I just dropped in. If I wasn't Catholic, you know, I went. All right, I was willing. And uh, now we know that all churches are not created equal. Not every church, and in fact, I couldn't find any church for a while. I went to a number of them. They weren't ready for somebody like me to show up. I'm still long hair. I'm still fuzzy. I'm still, I'm still doing drugs. You know, I'd like to th- be able to tell you that I had this experience in bed. The power of God came all over me. I was totally delivered, and it was all different. I had a vision of Jesus. None of that happened. I'll tell you what did happen. I made this, what was for me, a quality decision. I had another buddy. His name was also Dennis. Dennis and I, he, we'd get together and we'd, and we'd go, we're going out to party and stuff and take our drugs and do all our stuff. That was our, we'd been doing this for a long time. Well, after I'd had this experience, next time Dennis and I did get together, and we had a little entrepreneurial stuff going, so we had an extra supply of stuff, you know, and that we were selling. So we had a fair amount of, you know, for just a couple of guys, we had a fair amount of extra stuff. But uh, I told Dennis, I said, look, here's the thing. We got to make a change. I said, we can't keep doing this. We've got to go after Jesus. And, you know, Dennis was also pretty, I mean, we, all right, anyway, you get it. But he says, yeah, man, I think you're right. We got to go after Jesus, you know, far out. Yeah, we had a very limited vocabulary in those days, but we were we communicated amazing things. It was weird. <laughs> so I said, "So here's what we're going to do. This is our decision." So I'm making a decision for the both of us. I said, "Dennis, we're not going to buy any more stuff. We're buying nothing new. We're going to use what we have." <laughs> I mean, it's I laugh now. It, it is so pathetic. And it's so embarrassing in so many ways and on so many levels. But I felt like I had made this quality decision. Mm -hmm. We're not buying anything more. We're going to use what we have. Now, we had several weeks, (laughs) you know, of this. And then one time we came together, Dennis and I, and we're getting ready to do whatever we were going to do. We weren't doing the same parties we were doing, but we were having a few people and have smaller (laughs) parties. But I'm making this shift, and I know that sounds like such a contradiction, and and I get that. I mean, I can't even really, it doesn't even sound right now that I'm explaining it, knowing all that I know now. But that's just the way it went. And so I'm still getting stoned, but I'm looking for a church. And so, now I wasn't stoned when I went to church. I had been last night. So you're still a little fuzzy in the morning. And I still had the same, you know, still the long hair, the same appearance and stuff. And, but I found this, I found a church. They were not ready for my kind. They didn't even want. It's like, you can feel it. You know how you do. You can feel it. So, like, why are you here? 
Well, if you got to ask, I guess I don't know either. <laughs> you know, I mean, and of course I didn't have, you know, love of Jesus attitude about everything. And so it was a while before I began, to, you know, I, I couldn't find a church. And the church, and I'm saying this in a, in a broad sense, the church in the broad sense, not just single congregations, but in a broad sense. For the most part, the church was totally unprepared for the drug culture, the Jesus people, to start finding their churches. They didn't even know if they wanted this. Because in a lot of settings, okay, now I'm about to start preaching. You got to watch it. But in a lot of settings, and in a lot of church settings, people are fine with the way we have it and the way it's always been. This is what we like, and this is all we want. And so the idea of affecting a generation or reaching out to anybody else is not even on their radar. Somebody can help them. It's just not going to be here. And I felt that when I went into these places. I didn't know to say it that way, of course. I do now, looking back. But man, you felt it. You knew it. And I kept looking. I didn't go to Bethel Tabernacle. I still didn't know anything about it yet. You know, John mentioned it, but it never occurred to me to actually go there. Weird, you know. But I'll say this, one day I passed a church, it was a new building. I would have passed it many times. I'd never noticed it before. It was probably, it must have been on a Saturday or it was, I don't, it must have been on a Saturday. I was riding my bicycle. I had a motorcycle, but you know, I had a few problems with that and wasn't always in a frame of mind where it was good to ride it. So a bicycle seemed less threatening and so I was probably on my bicycle riding by and I saw there was a guy in the flower bed of this church, new building. I never really noticed any of this before. I'm looking for a church. So I, I, I stop, I walk over to the guy in the flower bed. I said, hey, my name is Dennis. Can you tell me about this church? He said, well, yeah, I'll tell you about it. He said, in fact, I'm going to go to a nursery and we're going to, I got to buy more flowers to get in here today. Why don't you get in the truck and come with me? Sure. So, man, we're off going to go to a nursery. I, I don't remember if I'd ever even been to a nursery. What do you do there? And all I remember is riding in the truck, and this guy, the, he was, it turned out, I found out later, he was a deacon of the church. But he's putting flowers in, and he's, you know, dirty. And later, he turned out to have a worldwide ministry. Years later, we became close, close friends. His name is Ed Dufresne. This was Ed. He's in the flower bed. Now I'm in his truck. We're driving, and he's driving along. And I was expecting to hear something about the church. I don't know what Ed is talking about. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. I don't know anything. I don't even know if I knew the words Holy Ghost. The only ghost I remember anything about was Casper. <laughs> the friendly ghost. That didn't seem to fit the moment. I didn't, so I don't know what he's... But I remember, I really do remember this so much. He's, we're driving along, he's driving, and he's going on about whatever it is. Whatever he's saying. But he has so much life in him. I mean, I know what to say now. I didn't know then. But I'm, I'm looking at him. He is so full of whatever this is. And it's all flown out. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I do remember this thought going through my head loud and clear. Wow. <laughs> all right, there's that limited vocabulary, but I'm, wow. Now this is far out. <laughs> I couldn't wait to go to church tomorrow. Mm. I couldn't wait. Mm. 
And I did. I went to that church the next Sunday, which was tomorrow. It was in the morning. And I showed up like I always, this is all I wore, jeans. I still, have, I still wear jeans. But they were... These they were are, like mine. Yeah, yeah, it's a little more like that. I would have had patches probably. Okay. You know? Well, I don't even do the patches. No, don't so bother. You were better than me. <laughs> no, actually wasn't. <laughs> but uh, I, w- I showed up, I had t-shirt, jeans, some kind of funky looking shoes. But if I went to someplace special, you put on socks, you know, that. So I had my socks also. I went to church. And there's the guy from the flower bed. He's a door greeter. He's got a suit on. Of course, all the guys, every, all men had suits on. That was the deal. I didn't. I didn't look like any of them. None of them looked like me. There was nobody in the church like this, but Ed shook my hand when he saw, he was so excited I was there. He about shook my arm off. Hey, man, I'm glad. Look, you're in. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, come on in. You know, he was, there's all this energy. There's all this welcome. There's all this, my gosh, somebody is glad I'm here. They're not tolerating me. Anyway, I went in and when I walked in, I knew I'd found home. And I really had. I was the only guy like this. But that even started to change. Others started to come. And you know how you are. Ex-stoners, birds of a feather flock together. We'd gravitate because we all had a lot of hair. (laughs) It was a big deal. But we found out way later, I mean years later, just a few years ago actually, that the pastor... Actually, uh, he had to stand up for us. As a few of, of the hippie type stoners started coming to the church, there were people in the church, they weren't happy about this. You know, we pray we want God to move. We pray we want God to use us, our ministry, our church, our whatever. But we typically, and this is what I find, we ask God to, you know, do what you want to do. I mean, we want this, but we envision it looking a lot like what it looks like already. We're all going to, anybody that shows up, they're going to look pretty much like we do, and then that'll be great. Mm-hmm. Well, that isn't what was happening then, and I just got news, and you probably already got this because you're here on Saturday night. Well, it's not going to look like that this time either. God's setting a stage for major things. And it's just not going to look like it's looked before. And we have to be ready for that. This pastor was ready for it. There were some that were. Bethel Tabernacle got ready for it. I love to take you through their story. It was phenomenal. But he had to, this pastor had to stand up for us. People came to him. We found out, just like I said, a few years ago, not knowing that anything like this happened. That pastor was called on the carpet by some of the people in the church about these long-haired freaks coming, these Jesus freaks. You know, we're not sure about all this. And he just let them know. He said, well, you need to get sure about it. I mean, he didn't patty cake with them. He just let him have it. Nobody was going to push the pastor around. He stood up for us. Now, we didn't know it at the time, but we knew the spirit of it was there. He could tell. Looking back, we you know, didn't know that that's what we were experiencing, but he was, he was creating a culture. Even within some staunch, tough nut to crack type Christians, this is going to be a safe place for these guys. Glory to God. Thank God that he did. Anyway, that was a long answer. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's good. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking of all the things that you went through in your life and, and what you've shared to us this, to this point is that it was almost, it felt like acceptance was what drew you into Jesus. 
That's a good way to say it. It really was. Mm -hmm. I was looking for that acceptance. Yeah. I didn't get it a lot of places. But on the inside, here's something though, even amongst the rejection mm -hmm. that I could feel from these churches or the deadness. I mean, I didn't know to call it that, but when yeah. the guy up front, he's talking out of the newspaper and I don't know what he's talking about either, mm -hmm. but it was dead. Mm -hmm. well, I don't need this. Yeah. But it was, I didn't connect mm -hmm. until Ed and this church connected me. Yeah. So yeah, when I was welcomed, yeah. I had found a place that I felt I could I could get what I needed to have happen for me here. Hmm. That was huge. That is huge. Well, especially without your father in your life, moving in the season where there was that hole, you know, someone who would walk with you and step into life with you. I'm sure that God used multiple men and probably has in the years after Absolutely. to continue to, to be that for you and Absolutely. to walk with you and to step into that with you and so now you're a minister. I mean, for, for our church, we don't really, like this church here, most of them don't know you. Right. And so the reason why I wanted to sit down with Dennis was because David and I really feel that it's important to bring people into the church that we love and trust. And, and we don't want to just open the church up to anyone. And, and it's out of respect for you guys that we really want to take the time to, to, to say this is why Dennis comes, is because Dennis is a man who's put the time in, who's loved the people well, and you can trust him. How are you going to know that unless we have some times where you can see that in his eyes as he talks about his heart, his heart and his life? And so I hope that this is, this is beneficial to you so that when we bring Dennis in again, and it might be completely different, Dennis... So I found out. Right? Um, <laughs> but that there's, a, there's already going, that more than just us can say, oh no, he's the real deal and he really loves the people and he has something of value to bring. Now, Dennis, as you've walked in your journey with the Lord, in your own personal journey, um, how have you come to know the voice of the Lord for yourself? You know, and how have you come to trust that voice for, of the Lord for yourself because all of us I think I can look at everyone in this place tonight and realize that every single person in here is is walking a life that we're hanging on to what's the voice of the Lord for me in my next season the, the thing that's right around the corner I need to know that that's the Lord and trust him and I need to step into this with the Lord I don't want to do this by myself right. how did you how did you get to know that and in this season you know what does that look like for you well, those were that's several questions, yes, it is. and I uh, which I like, and I'm I'll try to unwrap what I can. You know how did I how did I become acquainted and have some confidence that I could hear from the Lord or that I could follow His path and His direction? And there were s some significant events that God helped me with that. But it began because I had a hunger for this to happen. At least it began for me this way. I wanted to pursue this. I started to realize right away that God wanted to do things. And not just with me, but he wanted to do things and walk with people in a dynamic where people are uh, an extension of God, not an attachment to God. And where God's not an attachment to them, but there is this extension of life where it's the real deal. But we have to know what God's doing and saying for that to become real for us. Man, I, right from the start, man, I was hungry for this stuff. I wanted the supernatural in my life. I wanted, and I believed it. I had pursued it truly with, through the drug scene. And, you know, some of the Indian stuff gets in there and that, you know, helps you figure out some spiritual side. And then you hear some goofball like Timothy Leary talk about light and you can pursue light, which you later realize is the road to death. But I believed in the supernatural side of God and that it wasn't, for me, it was never going to be about going to church. It was all about Jesus. 
It wasn't going to be about fitting into a church culture. It was going to be about walking it out with Jesus. But it had to be within an environment and a structure. And that's what I had to discover. But I was hungry for it. So I guess part of the walk of this coming about for me was that I genuinely had this hunger for this, and I wanted these gifts of God. I wanted whatever God wanted. You know, you're, how you can be right early on, you say, oh, God, whatever you want. You know, that's what I want. Wherever you send me, that's where I'll go. All these kind of commitments that, you know, he later talks to you more clearly about. <laughs> but he actually walked me through something. And I'll, I'll just tell you the experience. And, you know, this isn't going to relate to a lot of people because this was just my experience. But there's, some, there's things in here that I want you to, to hear anyway. Because I, I'd plugged into this church now, and they got a youth minister in there, and they decided we were going to have this little retreat to the mountains. And, man, I was for it. It was just a handful of us. And... and uh, I'd already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now I'm way in, man. I'm, and, you know, I'm seeking. I want everything I can get my hands on. By now, we've gone over to Bethel on off nights because Bethel went on every night. So we'd gone over there and just... So it, it was part of it, and not all of it, but part of it was that for me, it wasn't just an experience. It was a life I'm living Every day, forever. It was paramount in my life that I was serving Jesus. That was it. So now we're going on this little retreat, and the youth minister, he said, we're going to take some time, and you're going to go out, and you're going to get by yourself. Just you and God. And you're just going to pray for a little while. You do whatever you want to do. Worship, sing, do whatever. Just you. You don't go out with anybody as you find a spot. And we were up in the mountains, and it was, you know, so I wander off into the woods and find a rock, a big rock. Oh, cool. I'm going to go sit up there lotus style, and I'm going to talk to Jesus, you know. <laughs> and uh, But I did. And I heard something flash through my head. I didn't know where this came from, and it was just a simple nothing almost. But it was this. You're going to do something tonight in the collective service. That's how I understood it. You're going to do something tonight that you've never done before. That's all it was, is vague. But when you do, you're going to know that I spoke to you here on this rock. Well, you know... I've had a lot of things blow through my brain. And I don't really put a lot of credibility into all of it, particularly at that stage. So honestly, that didn't really stick and mark my thinking all that drastically, sitting on the rock. But that service that night came. It was just a handful of us. We were standing in a circle. You know, these were the kumbaya days, you know. We'd just sway and pray and... Suddenly something, when I mean, we're in this time of worship and prayer, just standing in this circle, and something starts rumbling. I don't know how else to describe it. Rumbling on the inside. What? I don't even know what I'm doing. We're, everybody's quiet, our eyes are closed, and it's one of these moments. And in, in a moment, I go through all this stuff, and I blurt out, kind of loud, really, what I now know, Scripture calls a message in tongues. I spoke out in tongues, loud. Now, I was, it, it was different from praying in tongues. This was different. And I mean, it erupted out of me. It, it, it's like an explosion happened. Now, obviously, you know you can control that. I didn't want to control it. I just want to, whatever this is, I, and, it, and here comes what I now know was, a message in other tongues. And the guy next to me, Jeff, my buddy, we'd gotten saved nearly the same time, baptized the same day, and all this. He gives out an interpretation of tongues. I, he had never done that either. Well, I don't even know what he said. Because I was so cranked about what had just happened for me. And the Spirit of God said, 
I told you about this on that rock. And he said, now you know what I sound like. Now I'll be honest with you. When I think back of this, he sounded a whole lot like I sound. (laughs) You know, I mean, I couldn't have really said emphatically coming off the rock that I had heard from God. It just sounded more like a thought that passed through my head that I had no reason to think. And it didn't really make a great impact or a lot of sense until it was verified that night. But I've had so many times since that the Lord helped me when he'd say something to me, but it didn't necessarily strike me with a great deal of, of depth. You know, you can get thoughts. Where'd that come from? What's that all about? But for a little while, the Lord would kind of underscore it at times and say, just like when I talked to you on the rock. Now, when he'd bring that up, now I'm paying attention. So the reason I'm taking you through this is because for me, and, and I know that's not everybody's experience, but for me, he helped me walk through developing a sense of awareness and confidence that I really could hear from the Lord. And that it really didn't sound all that different from the way I sounded. But what he would say would be something I probably would not have said. <laughs> you know, where did that, what was that? Or why did I think that? And I promise you this, just knowing how it goes, you've had these same experiences, whether you really identified that it was the Lord saying this to you or not. We typically, and I do too, I've tried to develop how to not do that, we dismiss it. What was that? Why did I think that? And then later you say, you know, I had a hunch that was going to happen, you know. So sometimes we just call the voice of the Lord a hunch. When it really was the Lord saying something. But we can cultivate it anyway. This goes on and on with guys like me. So, was there another question in there somewhere? Or should I? I guess my question is, is when as you're speaking into the church tonight... What's one thing in your heart that you feel like you've heard from the Lord that's for the body of Christ that we can grab onto and say, okay, we're going to step into that alongside of you or as the body works into that together? That's a, that's a huge, huge question. It's a huge question. And I'm not sure for me there's just one single answer, which is sad because we could be here till morning if I really let it happen. But when I, to kind of connect where we started and how this goes and what I think this really means to us right now. There's a couple of factors. For me early on as a believer, what I caught, and I caught it maybe, I caught it before I met Ed, the guy in the flower bed. But I think I saw it in action. There was a very real passion in the relationship I had with Jesus. And I think one of the things that marked even the Jesus movement as a whole was while there wasn't a great deal of knowledge about a lot of things, it wasn't about doctrine as much, which I do, I've come to understand is quite important, don't get me wrong. But it was a simple fall in love passionately with Jesus. And I think even now, what society is, is hungry for is the same thing we've always been hungry for. And you hear it in different terms, but one of the things, and we talked about this a little today at lunch, but one of the things you hear talked about in a terminology that young people, but it's not just young people, Every, every one of us are hungry for what's real, what's authentic, and what is really out of the heart of Jesus. There's nothing new about that. But there's something fresh about that right now. 
For me, early on, there was an almost immediate, after I finally did run out of drugs and got away from, I'm out of that now. There was a, a very clear passion for the Jesus life. They called us Jesus freaks. That was a term that was used. It wasn't used affectionately, really, in the beginning. And I thought it was because we dressed goofy and it was, we weren't in the Jesus Christian kind of theme of things. But you come to find out that that was really right across the board. It was in the courthouse. It was in the White House. Not Nixon himself, but around him, believe it or not. They called some of these guys Jesus freaks. Why? It wasn't appearance. It was passion. It was really, for real, all about Jesus. We're not in this to try to fit in, you know, and for the, the stoners and the rebellious 60s and 70s guys, fitting in was not important. But for society as a whole, really, you come to realize we really do want to be liked and feel like we're part of something. Well, coming to know Jesus suddenly made you a part of the biggest thing that there really is. So I think the message that while I teach scripture, I teach faith, I teach Holy Spirit, I teach following the leadership of the Lord, there's so many things we can discover. The Christian life is a life of discovery, but it is a life of discovery only really because there is a deep-seated passion to know Jesus. And it goes back to something you hear and heard for years. Our assignment, our life is to know him and then make him known. Yeah. Man, that is forever been what we hear, but are we still defined by that? Or have we let the clamor and clutter and politics and economies and threats of the day and fears in society and governmental intrusions and injustice, have we let that become what defines the way we see things? We've got we to gotta strip it back to what's real. Make sure that the passion to know him is paramount for us. I think, for me, that's what connects my past and my present. And I think it's what needs to pave my future. All of the things I love to teach, and men I love to teach. Don't get me wrong, men. I, I could, we could go all night on a variety of things I would love to teach. And it's important stuff. So I'm not opposed to it. But we've got to connect it and get it down to the bare, raw reality. It's really all about Jesus. It's not about the knowledge we have. It's about the relationship, which is going to turn into a passion that agrees with what he is passionate about. And that is that his love for people is made real to more people. We got to let it somehow come out. Yeah, that's good. Well, I hear you talking about courage and bravery and sensitivity and wisdom and allowing the Lord to be the counselor. There's so many things that I think that we have that are beautiful and exciting in the days ahead. But I feel like it's intentional. It's not something that we're just going to come to at certain age where things are going to sort of come easier or it's going to be, I think I used to think when I was younger that when I got to, you know, my, when I got to the point of my twenties, I would just know things then and I'd be more comfortable in my own skin and I would be able to just feel myself all the time. And then I thought in my twenties, well, maybe when I got to my forties, you know, I'm just going to know a little bit more about life and I'm going to have that wisdom that comes naturally and, and I'm going to be calm and, and settled and comfortable. And then I, you know, I'm in my forties and now I think it really has nothing to do with age. 
It has everything to do with your time spent with the Lord. And some of my, um, I think that some of the people that I look up to the most are the ones that have a very quiet, simple life that just love comes out of them so easily. And I don't think it was by accident, but I, I see an intentional walk with the Lord, a getting away with the Lord. And I think in our society where things are so busy all the time, and the requests and even our wants keep growing, that there's going to have to be a season where we come to the point where we say, nothing is more valuable to me than getting away with the Lord. Even if it's a midnight walk, even if it's a uh, you know, time spent in, in intentional questions to yourself going, how much do I love the Lord? And how much am I willing to sacrifice for him? And I, I feel like we're at that season as a church where um, as a body overall, not just the church of Jubilee, but the church of Jesus Christ, that if we really have desire to see others come to know Christ, we're going to have to be intentional in how we're walking with others who don't know Christ. I mean, how many of us know someone who doesn't know the Lord how much time have we spent not witnessing? I'm not saying go out and witness to them. I'm saying how much have we spent on our knees for them first to ask the Lord what's his plan and his intention to use you in drawing that person to the Lord. And um, it comes down to just a really intentional question of our heart and letting the Lord show us what our, what our niche is you know, because we have evangelists who do such an amazing job of what they need to do, even out in just the body in their workplace. We have evangelists. We have those who are teachers. We have those who are compassion. We have those who are just outside working in the yard who drew you into relationship. So what's our position, our placement? And I was challenged with this just the other day. I was buying a lawnmower, and I really just needed a lawnmower. And I was kind of not looking for anything more than just to purchase a lawnmower. But I found one way out in Ditsbury, which was a bit of a drive. I figured, oh, well, I'm going that way anyway. So I got there, and there's this older gentleman who began to, um, he showed me his lawnmower, and I said, thank you very much. And then he began to open up his life. And I, I just remember standing there thinking, one, do I care? Because he had a lot to say. Do I care? Two, if I care, what do I have to do about it? You know, so one, I had to choose to care that the burden that he was carrying, that I, that I was going to listen, just listen to his heart. And he spent about 10, 15 minutes talking to me about all his hardships. And you know, you could, I could see that it was genuinely straining on him, that he didn't know what to do. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, Wouldn't you, would you offer to pray for him? Well, that just feels a little Christianese, doesn't it? And yet it wasn't my own thought. I remember that. So I just asked him, would you, would you be open to prayer? And he said, you'd pray for me? And I said, sure. And so I began to pray for him. And at first I was just like, I don't even know what to pray. But as I began to pray for him, I just was trying to listen to the Holy Spirit because he might have said something that was one thing that he really needed prayer for was another. Just to listen to the Holy Spirit going, how, okay, how do I pray? And when, when we were done, he had these tears streaming down his cheeks and he said, that was so great. It was like a fresh glass of water for him. You could see that he, that he felt cared for. That's right. You know, that he, saw, he felt seen. And I was just buying a lawnmower. Yep. You know, and so then he messaged me. It was on Virage sale that I bought this. He messaged me afterwards and said, thank you so, so much. You know, and so I just left him a little note. And I, about, you know, thank you for opening up to me. I'm a stranger. But I just want you to know that God really sees you and he cares about you. You have no idea. We have no idea who that man is, who that man runs into or what that man sees in Jesus because he saw it in me. And so we have this calling as the body of Christ to step into that. And we know this, right? We all know this. But it is the decision of, do I care? And if I care, then what will I do with that? Do you have anything else you wanted to add as we close up tonight? Oh, that's, I love that, though. There's a naturalness, I think, about being able to share Jesus. It's not as complex as 
the devil would like us to think. And people are more open oftentimes. Not always, but oftentimes they're far more open. It's almost surprising like this. This is almost shocking. And it shocks them that we would have some input for them of any type, that we would care enough to do that. And, and we, know, we, we know how to do that. We don't, know how to, we don't have to know how to do a lot, but we know how to do that. But it does take the choice. So we choose to live it in our life and have Jesus and that passion for the Lord. But that, ha- that will turn into that challenging thing because God sets this stuff up. He wants us to be able to multiply and to be the salt of the earth. But that's not just by living it. It isn't. It's by also replicating it and letting it come out. Not in an obnoxious, that wasn't obnoxious. And I find it can be so natural because that's who we really are. But we've, and I've done it too, we've let our fear of either not knowing what to say or do or will they, I don't want to ram religion down their throat, which of course if you don't have religion then that's not going to be a problem. But we let ourselves get talked out of it. And instead of that, that was good. Made the decision to care. To care enough to take it into a form of action. There's got to be action. You know, the doctor can pass somebody that's had an accident on the road with the knowledge of how to maybe help this situation. But it's getting out of your car, changing your day, going over and doing something here. Even if, in that case, even if it didn't work. But it is the doing of it. And for us, I think that's, that's the next step that has to happen. As we get out, we push the envelope of our own fears, or our own insecurities, or our own questions. And we just offer it. Something simple. It's life changing. The other person has never had anybody that cared that would do that. They've never had anybody to say what you just said. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway. Well, to close this up, I just want to share a quick story. I was talking to a friend of mine who was um, working with the Calgary police, and when he got the job, which he wanted so badly, and if you know the process of becoming a Calgary police or any police of any city, it's a lot of sacrifice. You hardly get paid for like six months while you're going through training, and they can put you anywhere, and, and so it's a real sacrifice to actually step into that lifestyle, and he said he was so excited and so eager, he was willing to give anything up to have this position, and so he started working as a police for a while, and he was put in the northeast um, um, section by Marlboro Mall there. And he said, you know, every time he turned around, there was a crisis. And he said, and it wasn't just a crisis. It was that, that you, um, you know, it wasn't like a new thing. It was like generations of the same families causing the same issues. You know, it was like this family would, would, would move to Calgary and they would be, you know, dealing drugs and then they'd have kids and then their kids would grow up and they would do the same things. And it was generation upon generation. And it was almost like, oh, that's that family. And he said, I got to the point where I'd seen so many drug busts and so many things going on that it wasn't really uh, a new thing anymore. And I didn't, I lost my passion because I thought I could change something. He said, and now I realize this problem's so much bigger than just putting the wrong guys in jail. This was a generational heart thing. And he said, and I just lost my passion to the point he said where I would be dog tired you know, and at the beginning, I'd be dog tired and think, throw me on another shift. I can change the world. And he said, and then I got so tired that or I would come home from work and I would think if there was a dead body on my lawn, I would just get up and put it on the neighbor's lawn and go to bed. I'm just so tired of issues. And I think for the body of Christ, we've seen so many hurting. And at the beginning, we were passionate about the hurting, passionate about the lost, passionate about seeing them come to Christ. But now there's just so many more issues upon issues that do we really care? Do we feel like we have the answers anymore? You know, or or have we let our own selves become discontent, less passionate, not quite believing like we did, and we just want to go home from a day's work and go to bed? 
And I feel like it's time for us as the body of Christ and me included to actually poke my head up and go, who are my neighbors? You know, do I care? You know, Gabrielle's been saying, mom, we need to have our neighbors over for five years. We finally are having them over next week. Like, do we care? You know, and I'm asking myself that question, do we care? And I'm looking at, at us as a church, I'm looking at predominantly probably the most mature group of, of people in our church right now represented right here. And what I'm saying is, is I, I don't think we can disconnect. I don't think that we can get to an age where we can say, you know what, I'm laying off my hat now, I'm retired. It's not, it's, we can't get to that point. We've, we've got to say, okay, Lord, now what? Did you call me for missions? You know, how many of us in this place haven't longed to be involved in missions? Haven't longed to do street ministry? That was something we thought of in our youth when we were still passionate and thought we could make a difference. What if the Lord resurrected those old dreams? What if the Lord gave us new dreams? What if we began to see ourselves as active members in the body of Christ and our days weren't over yet? I, I'm, just, I'm just saying this for myself even. You know, because it can get to the place of disappointment or frustration. David and I could be so disappointed over this empty seats here. But guess what? It just takes one voice to make a difference. And maybe just maybe the people that are here are the ones that are supposed to be here. And this is enough to change our world. So what if we believe that, you know? So we press on towards the call forgetting what lies behind. And we move on to what God's called us to do. And we step in to sync with the Holy Spirit, realizing that there could be Dennis's just outside our door. And maybe, just maybe mowing the lawn isn't such a menial task after all. You know what I mean? Maybe, just maybe, we've been positioned by the Holy Spirit to make a difference. I can't imagine how many people have heard your voice over the years that may not have ever heard them if you hadn't come face to face with someone who cared. That's right. That's right? Absolutely. And, and yet you, you've spoken to thousands of people over the years in all kinds of places with more than the, this people, <laughs> amount of people. And your voice has made a difference. And just maybe, just maybe... We're here in that position where God can still use our, our hands and feet and voices to speak into that next person who can speak into that next person who can speak into that next person. Man, are, are we encouraged tonight? I, I, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraging myself, but I'm encouraged. Tonight. I want the Holy Spirit to do something in all of us tonight, and obviously you do too. I think that's what this is all about anytime we're together. But I think there's something about the days ahead. We look to the past and you find certain things that are vital that helped you. And you can, each one of you have been going through your own personal story as I've shared things in mine of how God navigated you to bring you to where you are now. And I think what Jocelyn has just said about the importance of these days now, and of our attitude of being productive and useful at whatever stage you're in, whatever stage I'm in right now, these aren't days that we are winding down. It's certainly not days when the kingdom of God is winding down. There are more people getting saved and healed and delivered right now than ever before in all of history. And it's not just the big meetings that make this happen, which I'm in favor of, by the way. But it's primarily just this type of thing where each one of us, everybody does their part. And I believe the Holy Spirit's asking all of us something, and, and I'll use something God said to a close friend of mine, Kenneth Copeland whom I've known for decades, and he's 82 or 81, really, 81 years old right now, and has been in ministry over 50 years, and had one of the most 
prolific and powerful ministries of anybody I know. And it wasn't all that long ago, the Lord asked him a, a particular question. And he positioned it this way with Kenneth. Kenneth had turned 80. And, you know, he's been in ministry 50 years. Heaven sounds good. We all believe in heaven. We do try to put it off as long as possible, but we believe in it. It's going to be great. He said the Lord talked to him about this very directly and specifically. He said, Kenneth, he said, were you as anointed at 40 as you were at 50? That's how he asked it. Not really, no. And, and Kenneth understood the context and the meaning was as, as, as fruitful, or were you doing, seeing as much and as many results and seeing things happen through your life at, to the same degree at 50 or at 40 as you did at 50? No. He said, did you see the results at 50 that you then saw after you were 60? No, I didn't. And he said, did you see this? And he took them all the way through. Did you see the results at 60 that you began to see at 70? No, not really. You see, did you see the results at 70 that you're seeing now in the fruit? And he said, no, not really. And of course, Kenneth began to catch where this is headed. But then the Lord said it very directly. He said, I've had things I've wanted to bring into the earth through men and women who are in their 80s, in their 90s, who are over 100, who are over 110. But I don't ever get anybody that will stay that long. They quit. Will you be one of those people for me? And Kenneth said, I knew I had my free will and choice to make. And I could make any choice I wanted. But how do you turn down a request like that? Well, here I'm 64. Society tries to tell people that it, you hit mid-60s, you know, best days are behind you. These are your sunset years. It's downhill from here. And then you look in the mirror and you feel there's verification. <laughs> Testament to that truth every single day. That's not the way the kingdom is designed. And we have to push back on this aggressively. We have to push this out and say, look, I haven't done everything right all along. I'm not doing everything right now. But there is a future that I'm stepping into. I'm making the choice. And I like what you said, that choice. I'm making the choice to care. Because that really is the heartbeat of God. We know it is. But man, life at its best is when that's the way it's beating on the inside of us. That is life at its best when we've not only cared, but when somebody's life was really impacted because of it. Holy smoke. Paul calls it an addiction to the ministry. That's what it is. The, this stuff that we're talking about, it's not just for preachers. It's for every one of us. It is the most addictive substance in the universe. Because it's how we're wired. We're wired for this. We were made for real love. And this is love in action. It is letting go of ourself in that moment, in any given moment. Now, some of it can be really drastic. It can be out on the streets, confrontational. That's not for everybody. I mean, it's cool if it is. I mean, that's great. There's great stories. 
I mean, one of my favorites is from a guy that picked me up at a church in Minnesota I was going to be speaking at, and he was a prisoner for years, and he had a really tough life. But now he's in the church, man. He leads people on street witnessing every Friday night. They go right into the heart of Minneapolis, and it's, it's in-your-face stuff. I mean, this, and this guy just thrives. But he told me this story, that, and he said, we, went out, we go out two by two, but this particular time we had an odd number. I went out by myself, others, but we met and then prayed, and then everybody goes out in different directions. He said, I was on my own by myself, and he said, you know, we're in, we're in a you know, tougher part of town, which didn't concern this guy. That was fine. And he said, here over here, I see, as I walk, turn a corner or whatever, he said, I see, here's a pretty big fella standing over here. And he's leaning up against the, the wall of a bar behind him. And he's just standing there by himself. And he said, he's a pretty rough looking guy. Now, coming from the guy that I'm hearing say this, for him to say it's a rough looking guy, man, I'm going, what was that? But because uh, he, was, he was still pretty tough looking. I'm glad we were friends. But anyway, he walks up to this fellow, and apparently he's a pretty big fellow. And he said, uh, I walked up to him, and I, whatever his opening line was, he said, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Or some kind of opening line. And he never kind of had an exact script. He just went with the flow. He said, this guy kept his arm folded. He looked, he kind of looked through the slits of his eyes down at me and he said, get away from me. (laughs) That was it. That's all he said. He said, Dennis, the quiet guys like this, they're the most dangerous. You don't know what they're going to do. He said, but, you know, I just pressed in a little further. He said, and then he, he, he said, I looked up. The guy must have been big. Do you have any idea how much Jesus actually loves you? And he said, I just stayed there. He said, you don't know what is about to happen. He said, this guy looked at me, and it seemed like for the longest time. And then suddenly, he collapsed and fell into me. I had to hold him like cradling a baby. Tears started coming out of this big guy's eyes, and he, he said to me, he said, I can't remember the last time anybody said they loved me. It broke him. Obviously, he gave his life to Jesus, man. We, we don't know what's going on here. But that willingness to care enough that, and in his case, you know, he's kind of putting it out on the line. It's not all like that. You know that. But there's something inside of you that is designed for this. You know it. And whether it's in prayer, praying for somebody, just telling somebody, you know, I just, I know this sounds maybe odd where we're standing right now, but I got to tell you. Man, Jesus loves you and wants to change your life for the better. Or whatever. Just like that. Something can happen that is absolutely revolutionary. And these are the things the Holy Spirit takes. So anyway, I could go on all night. But Yeah, we have to conclude, but I think the, centered, the self-centeredness that, that we can have in our lives pulls us away from the I care about you. Mm-hmm. You know, and I found that with what the enemy's tactic seems to be, and think about your own personal situations in your life, is that that record player in your mind goes over and over about what you're dealing with, the situations going on in your mind that you can't escape. And so when you see people that pass you by, you don't care because you are stepping into, I care about what I've got on my mind, my heart, my needs, my desires that I actually don't know if I can handle anymore. So I don't really have time for what you have to say. And I think that we're, we're being pressed in to move past that point and, and to see what God has past our own self. And that's when, we, that's when our faith grows, too. So when we see God moving on the behalf of other people through you, and you know you didn't deserve God to move through you because you're really not there. 
maybe in your faith or in whatever area of your life, you don't feel like you really have to give. But yet God uses you, and it's an exciting adventure, and all of a sudden your faith grows, and you're like, this situation in my life, it is going to change. It is going to change, and I trust that it is changing, because look what God did over here and over here and over here. And I think that's how God pulls us out of of our own self-centeredness, is that we have works, and faith is working with it, and we, we see God do amazing things that we don't deserve, that are his grace. Well, thank you guys for stepping into tonight in a different way. I hope this was productive for you and that it was, um, that it challenged us and also sparked some stuff on the inside of us. Um, thanks for having the patience as we work through some new things. And Dennis, thanks for being willing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. thank you. Glad yeah. we did this. Thank you for taking time to listen to today's message. If you are encouraged or challenged by what you heard today, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your story to mystory@jubileecalgary.com. You can also invest in the lives of others by partnering with us financially. Your gift can impact many as God works through your generosity to help us continue sharing this message with others. Donations can be given online at jubileecalgary.com backslash give. Your feedback and giving are truly appreciated.